Good evening. My name is Lauren. I'm a deacon here at Mercy View. Tonight we'll be reading in two passages. We'll be in 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, um, and also Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 8. So, beginning in 2 Timothy verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent and equipped for every good work. And in Isaiah 6, starting in verse 1, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having his hand, in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? For who will go for us? And then I said, Here I am, send me. This is the word of the Lord. Hello, hello. Good evening. Good to see you. Welcome to Mercy View. Um, if you're visiting with us tonight, special welcome to you. Honored that you've chosen to worship with us. Um, thank you for being here. I know it's the summertime and a lot of stuff is going on in life. And so just thank you for, uh, for everybody that's here tonight prioritizing this time together to come and, and worship God together. Um, real quickly before we jump into our passage, I had the privilege this morning of preaching at an a sister church in our network, the X29 Network in Oklahoma City, called Crosstown. And uh, what a great church, uh, great elder team there. And uh, just it was a very sweet time for us and our family uh, to, to go worship with another body. And, uh, and, but I wanted to say this to you, as much as we enjoyed our time this morning and we're blessed by our time there this morning, um, I absolutely love you guys. Like Mercy View, as much as we enjoyed our time this morning, this is like home. This is our people. And I'm so proud and honored to be a part of this church, running this race with you. And I hope you feel the same way. Um, I'm glad that, uh, I'm just glad to be a part of this with you. It really is a thrill. You know, we celebrated our 12th anniversary last year. There's been a lot of, of ups and downs and in and outs and all that. And, and the Lord has been faithful through it all. And uh, you guys are a big part of that. And I'm, I'm grateful for you. So thank you for, for how you minister to me and bless me and our family. Um, there is a song uh, that uh, when I was early in, in my marriage, uh, I just really fell in love with. And uh, it, it's a song that um, is filled with imagery um, that will make sense as I read the lyrics to you. And, and it was just, uh, the first time I heard it, I just remember being so overwhelmed with the reality of what this song meant for me in my relationship with God. And here's, here's some of the lyrics. It said, little stones are smooth. Only once the water passes through, so I am a stone, rough and grainy still, trying to reconcile this river's chill. But when I close my eyes... And I feel you rushing by. I know that time brings change and change takes time. And when the sunset comes, my prayer would be this one that you might pick me up and notice that I am just a little smoother in your hand. The second verse is sometimes raging wild, sometimes swollen high. Never have I known this river dry. The deepest part of you is where I want to stay and feel the sharpest edges wash away. It's by an artist by the name of Nicole 
Nordeman. And I don't know if you caught what Nicole is saying here, but basically saying you and I are like stones in a river. And this river is filled with the grace of God. And as it washes over us, over time, those sharp edges in our life begin to be smoothed out. Now, I don't know if Nicole specifically was talking about the the idea of sanctification, that, that big theological word that just describes the way that over our lifetime, God is changing us and transforming us and renewing us. But that's what I think of when I listen to this song. Like there is something about you and I putting ourselves in the way of God's grace and the river of God's grace. And what God intends to do over time, slowly, but surely, right? The line, uh, time, uh, change takes time, right? Over time, that water of, of God's grace, that river of God's grace begins to change us and form us. Tonight we are beginning the first of two summer series here at Mercy View on the topic of worship. In particular, what we're doing right now, gathered worship. We will be following this series up with another series in the book of Haggai, a small minor prophetic book in the Old Testament. But tonight, we want to begin to take a moment to talk about why we do what we do when we come together as a body to worship the triune God together. The name of this series you can see on the screen is By the Book, Scripture as Worship's Center. And in that name, you probably begin to get a sense of where we are headed. Here at Mercy View, we desire to see the Scriptures as the center of all of our gathered worship. And really the series is looking at different ways in which the the scriptures inform what we do here at at Mercy View. <clears throat> I we um I forgot to mention this. This past week we launched a uh a, a podcast or really relaunched our podcast the Cultivate Podcast. And what we did is set up the series, talked a little bit about Romans that we completed, but set up the series. And one of the things that um, I was reminded of as I was getting ready to do that with Trey this week was that um, I'm a why guy. And uh, I like to know why I do what I do. And actually here at Mercy View through the years at various times, we've done some series that have addressed why we do what we do. And we haven't done one of those in a while. So this series is kind of a why series for us to really help our hearts get in tune with with what we do here in worship, but really what God wants to accomplish in our worship together. And so I just want you to see one big thing tonight in our, our passages that we've looked, that we uh, heard read and are going to look at tonight, and it's this. Our confession in gathered worship is anchored in the authority of God's word. Our confession in this space tonight, in our gathered worship, and, and, and in the future, and we pray Lord in the past, is anchored in the authority of God's word. So here's really what's happening tonight. This message is setting the table for the rest of the series. And as we think about gathered worship here at Mercy View, really every element of our worship gathering is meant to help us confess the word, to help us uh, proclaim the truths about who God is, who we are, and how God has met us in our sin to rescue us and to redeem us. But we are not looking at ourselves for that. We're actually looking somewhere else. We're looking into the word of God because that's where we believe that power is found. It's found in the word of God. But we have to ask a question at the outset of this series Because ever since Cain and Abel, God's people have been asking, how do we worship? Like, what does that look like? What does it mean for us to worship God? Well, Jesus actually confronted this issue head on in his earthly ministry. You might remember the the Pharisees, the religious leaders of his day, were adding traditions to the religious life of, of the Jews, including worship, that really went beyond what God himself had commanded. And this in turn went against the grace that Jesus had come to preach. Uh, And what this did is it put people on a spiritual treadmill 
And this spiritual treadmill was one of works righteousness. In other words, the, the idea was if you did enough good things, enough good works, enough spiritual activity, you could earn God's favor or keep God's favor. It was exhausting what they were doing. And frankly, it was misleading, it was deceptive, and ultimately, it did not save. And we find one such confrontation in the book of Mark 7. You haven't heard this read tonight, but, but uh, don't turn there. Just listen to this. Here's what uh, is happening in, in our story in Mark 7, beginning in verse 1. It says this, Now, when the Pharisees gathered to him, Jesus, with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled. That is, unwashed. But the Pharisees and all the Jews did not eat unless they washed their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they came from the marketplace, they did not eat unless they had washed. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked Jesus, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands. Now on the surface, it may seem that the Pharisees are asking a hygiene question here, but they're not. They're asking a worship question. They're actually concerned with what should one do when they worship? Again, this, this question has been around for a long time. How do we worship? And so they had taught again in their tradition that in order to worship God correctly and rightly, you had to be clean. So Jesus addressed their concern, beginning in verse 6, and here's what he said. Did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites as it is written? By the way, just a side note, he just straight up calls them hypocrites to their face. Jesus was bold, but he says this. As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Here's what Jesus was saying to the Pharisees. Your worship is inconsistent. Your worship is ultimately in vain because it's hypocritical. See, Jesus was condemning the Pharisees for their wrong-headed worship, but I want you to notice why. Why was he saying their worship was in vain? He says they were teaching his doctrines the commandments of men. Here's what that means. The Pharisees had gone beyond what God had commanded in their worship and added other requirements to what they believed made worship right in their eyes. And that's what Jesus calls the doctrines uh, of the commandments of men. But Jesus is saying men adding commandments to worship makes it not worship anymore. Are you with me? This is the problem in Jesus' eyes. But I want you to also hear what Jesus says is the result of this kind of self-focused worship. In verse 13, Mark 7, what, what Jesus says is that this results in making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. That is a weighty word from the heart of Jesus. He is saying... By adding man-made requirements to worship beyond what God has commanded, the Pharisees are voiding the Word of God, the Scriptures, the Bible. Right? To void something, you know what that means, right? To declare that it is not valid, it's no longer of use. Jesus is saying that, that when you get really to the heart of, of what worship is all about, it's either are you trusting in the authority and sufficiency of the word of God or not. And if you aren't, you're not really worshiping. You're worshiping in vain. Or he says it even more strongly here again in in, in Mark 7. It is actually making void the word of God. In short, it wasn't worship because it distrusted the word of God to frame their worship in the right way. So here's why we need to start here in our series This confrontation between Jesus and the Pharisees shows a core principle that must drive any discussion that you and I have about what we do when we gather together in this space to worship as a family. We must remain convinced that the fundamental bedrock truth which 
all of our theology and practice of corporate worship must be founded in the authority and sufficiency of the word of God. As it says in the book of Jude, we must contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints found in the word of God. The confrontation here that Jesus has with the religious leaders also shows us that God rejects worship based on the traditions of men. So to say it as strongly as I can, God insists that his worship be shaped, directed by, regulated by his inspired word. Now the key text that I think emphasizes that authority is one that you heard Lauren read just a while ago in 2 Timothy. Let me just read that again because I think we need to have this roll over our hearts uh, one more time. Here's what it says. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now, we quote that a lot here. I think we quoted this like a couple of weeks ago in, in this time together because this is what we believe about the Bible. This is what we believe with every fiber in our beings here at Mercy View because we are a Bible people. We are standing in a very long line of Bible people that goes all the way back to maybe you could say the Reformation of the 16th century, but I, I think... You know, we find ourselves in a long line of Bible people from the very beginning of humanity. If you remember in the Reformation, they recovered uh, an idea called sola scriptura, which is a, a Latin phrase that just means scripture alone. Now, that's not to say that you and I should only read the Bible and nothing else. It just means that we believe that the Bible gives us everything that we need to know about everything that truly matters. Specifically, the idea of salvation. And Paul, in writing to one of his ministry partners, Timothy, says that the scriptures that you and I have in our hands or on our phones or on whatever digital platform we might be looking at, it is literally breathed out by the Spirit of God. So here's what that means. The Bible contains all of the authority of God within its pages. And as we think about the issue of worship that, that you and I were really created for, the idea here in 2 Timothy 3 is that the scriptures have the authority to equip us for every good work that has been prepared for us. That's why we want to say here at Mercy View that our theology and our practice of corporate worship is anchored in the authority and sufficiency of what God has spoken in his holy divine revelation, the word of God. So this brings me to the one big idea that I want you to see this evening, and it's this. Our confession, as we come together in every element and are confessing various things, our confession in all of those elements in gathered worship is anchored in the authority of God's word. Now, what does that mean practically for us? How does the authority of God's work actually work its way out in what we do in, in worship? If God's word is sufficient for us to understand and experience the gospel, how does that impact our gathered worship specifically? Well, I think it means really two things. There's a lot we could say, but I think two things in particular, and it's this, that the elements of our worship must be shaped by the word of God. And the form of our worship must be shaped by the word of God. So let's look at those two things real quick. First, the elements of our worship must be shaped by the word of God. Here are a few things that we see in the scriptures that help us kind of that give us a window in. To, here's some things that need to be happening when we gather together in worship. Paul commands Timothy in the context of teaching uh, him how to behave in the house of God to devote himself to the public reading of scripture. In 1 Timothy 4, we're actually going to spend a week here at Mercy View talking about the importance of reading and listening to the Word of God in gathered worship. Why we do that, why we do it as much as we do that, why it's important. He also says he, he, he repeats similar commands in places like Colossians and 1 Thess Thessalonians um, along those lines. 
Paul also commands Timothy to devote himself to exhortation and to teaching and to preach the word, to be ready in season and out of season, reproving, rebuking, and exhorting with complete patience and teaching. Paul is talking about this particular thing we're doing right now, preaching. Paul also commands that supplications and prayers and intercessions and thanksgiving be made for all people. In 1 Timothy 2, he commands the Colossians to continue steadfastly in prayer in 1 Timothy 4. And to the Ephesians, he says, pray at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication, making supplication for all the saints. And in both Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3, Paul commands gathered believers to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody to the Lord with your heart. And lastly, Paul says to the Corinthian church that he has passed on to them something called the Lord's Supper. It's what we call communion here. It's the same thing, having received it from the Lord himself. We read from 1 Corinthians 11, that very passage and phrase where Paul is talking about that. Those are the elements of worship that are shaped by God's word. Now, that's not an exhaustive list, but it's kind of a no less than list. It, it, it's, it's as if to say these are non-negotiables. These are the things that do need to be a part of this. There's some freedom in and around that, but those elements that you find in our gathered worship are shaped by what we see in the scriptures. That's why we do them in gathered worship. Are you with me? All right. So, in corporate worship, we confess the word. We confess the word, I think, kind of all through the service, but we actually have a moment in our uh, liturgy where we confess our sin, right? When we're confessing our sin, we're confessing the word. We're reading the word in our gathered worship. We're singing the word. We're preaching the word. We're praying the word. And if you've noticed here, I can't remember exactly when we did this, but we used to, after we read our benediction, uh, say something like, you're dismissed. But a, 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 a few years ago, I think, and maybe, it was, maybe it's more recent than that, we, we now say you are sent. Because this is a part of the movement that we find ourselves in, that, that this thing that's happening right now is not meant to terminate in and on, on itself. It's meant to propel us outward to the places we live, work, and play. But we must also say that the form of our worship must be shaped by God's word as well. So what does that mean? Well, here at Mercy View, we believe that our gathered worship, to the best of our ability as we look at the scriptures, should follow a biblically inspired structure each week that helps us confess the word, again, in, in every element, by really rehearsing the gospel as we walk through our service together. We borrow an old word to describe this sort of framework here at Mercy View. I just used it, but we call it our liturgy, uh, liturgy excuse me. We call it our liturgy. Liturgy is just another word to describe the order of service or, or walking through this series of elements. But there actually is a lot of depth, more depth to that than, than that. that. That's kind of on a surface level how I would define it. And actually, I'm not really going to unpack every part of our liturgy this week because we're going to be digging into the why of most of those elements in our series in the weeks to come. So tonight, really what I want to talk about at a high level is how the Word of God helps us structure our worship here so that in turn, we can confess the Word of God. And that process, week in and week out, forms us as if we're the stone in the river. Actually, you heard Sean speak to this earlier in his time of, of, of leading us through the, the early parts of our liturgy here tonight. He, I think he said something like, bit by bit over time, you're finding yourself changed and different. And you may not even realize as you're going through it that it's happening, but you might begin to look back at a year ago or three years ago or five years ago as you've been doing this. Man, I'm, I'm different. I'm responding differently in worship. I am, I'm understanding things more deeply about who God is and who I am than I did before. This process of of following this sort of biblically inspired structure is not a new idea. It's not a novel idea. It's a very old idea. In fact, in the Old Testament, worship followed a sequence of three offerings. The sin offering was given first. That, that sin offering symbolically cleansed people from their sins. 
Next came what was called the burnt offering, which was burned up entirely to signify the total dedication of worshipers to God. And then lastly, a fellowship or peace offering was offered. Having been cleansed from our sin and consecrated to God, the worshiper would now enjoy communion and friendship with God. Now, with the coming of Jesus, most of those Old Testament worship rituals, altars and animal sacrifices, burnt offerings have been abolished. But the basic pattern of approaching God is still there. Like cleansing, consecration, communion with God, those all remain the same. And since Christ has come, yes, the external practices of worship have changed, but the biblical pattern of approaching God really hasn't. God calls his people together to cleanse us of our sins, to remind us of our covenant obligations to him, to renew our fellowship with him, and then to send us back into his world as his ambassadors. The order matters. I want you to think of of a wedding. I went to one yesterday, actually. It was beautiful downtown at First Baptist Tulsa. And just sitting there in that setting, I was struck by how familiar I was with what they were doing. I almost knew what was coming next. Now, some weddings have surprised me. They got a little... Uh, went a little left to center in the planning, and they did something a little differently. But for the most part, let's just be really honest, every Christian wedding follows pretty much the same order, right? The bride is escorted down the aisle by our father. She is given away to the groom. Vows are repeated. Rings are given. The union is sealed with a kiss. And the minister pronounces the couple to be husband and wife. That order is intuitively obvious to all who are there. It was to me yesterday. It's like, I know this is just how it's supposed to be. But why? Because the wedding, or a wedding, is a covenant ceremony. And ceremonies like that proceed typically according to a certain ritual or form. There's a right order to them. We believe then, here Mercy View, that the same is true for our Christian worship. As Christians, we are God's covenant people. Our relationship with God is a covenantal relationship. So we gather weekly to renew that covenant according to the pattern that God gives us in Scripture. And let me just press this point home a little bit further. Here's why this is so significant. When you place yourself in the way of that week after week after week, it is formative. It changes you. Think about the rhymes and the songs and cadences you learn as a kid, right? The, the alphabet song, Happy Birthday, the Pledge of Allegiance. Maybe you can remember the theme music to your favorite childhood cartoon. I can. I'm not going to sing it for you. but or, or maybe the lines you remembered from your first school play. Like, why are those things so ingrained in your memory Because you sang them a lot, you rehearsed them a lot, you heard them a lot, you were in the way of them a lot. And what happened then is it had a formative effect on you. It shaped you. It created grooves in your soul and in your memory that you can easily recall to this day. I hear Sean talk about the Lord's Prayer. and um, We actually in our school didn't recite the Lord's Prayer. My parents did in the school that they grew up in. There was a time in our cultural consciousness that that everybody could recite the Lord's Prayer. It's not the case anymore, but part of the reason why everybody could is because they did it every day. And what did that do? It created grooves in their mind and in their soul. Author James K. Smith refers to these shaping experiences as secular liturgies. Our cultural institutions like in education and media, corporations, government, have a liturgical motive, a shaping motive. They want to shape you into a certain vision of the good life. They want to make you into a certain kind of person, a person who will buy their products or be loyal to their cause or embrace their ideals. The liturgy of Christian worship is a subversive countermeasure against the shaping influence of culture. By using liturgy in our worship, 
we are seeking to reform or to reshape people according to the gospel. The gospel is a counter liturgy up and against the larger culture as a whole. Rather than being defined by the world, we come into this place in gathered worship, put ourselves in the way of the gospel and all of these different elements so that we can be reminded of who we are in Christ. So that we can be reminded of the values of the kingdom of God so that we can be changed. And I think this formation takes place on a number of levels, three really. The first is a what I call a theological formation. Theological convictions aren't formed just through teaching and study. I think we would do well to, to just like go, okay, there are other ways that I'm being theologically formed. We are theologically formed when we sing, when we read creeds. When we read the Lord's Prayer earlier, we're being theologically formed. When we've been walking through the catechism, uh, the New City Catechism, we're being formed. And I think a church's theology can be felt in how it prays, how it sings, and how it treats the Lord's Supper. And as a church committed to historic kind of reformed theology here at Mercy View, with, we want the sovereignty of God and the sinfulness of man to be consistently portrayed in our rhythms. We want the redemptive drama of creation, fall, redemption, restoration to be felt, like felt and experienced every week regularly in worship. So theological formation is one thing that happens, but also spiritual formation. What we do in worship shapes the way we approach God in private. Now, there's an inverse relationship between both of those. The way that we worship God in private also affects the way that we worship in corporate worship. But by reading scriptures aloud each week, by confessing sin each week, by hearing the promises of the gospel spoken each week, by celebrating Jesus' death and resurrection in communion each week, we are forming our souls in a certain cadence or rhythm of worship. We are building habits that shape desires Maybe in unseen ways, at least in the moment. And then lastly, gospel formation is happening. If it's true that we never outgrow the gospel, friends, we need our hearts to be shaped more and more by that reality. In Christian worship, we are celebrating the gospel story. We are reminding ourselves of the truth of who we are and whose we are. We are ourselves Uh, People of the truth, learning the language of the gospel, becoming fluent in speaking it to ourselves and to others. And a gospel-infused liturgy shapes us more fully into a gospel-centered people. Let's end here. You heard Lauren read Isaiah chapter 6. In Isaiah chapter 6, at a very high level, you find the heartbeat of Mercy View's form of worship, why we do what we do when we gather together here in worship. It's really a reenactment of the cosmic gospel story. And in Isaiah 6 verses 1 through 8, I think we see a microcosm of what that looks like. And so we have actually organized our liturgy here to move through that progression that you see reflected in Isaiah 6. First, you begin to see in movement one of our worship shaped by Isaiah 6 verses 1 through 3 that that we are transported into the throne room of God. And the first movement of of worship here at Mercy is really intended for us to get our eyes off of ourselves and onto God because we are not Him. We've come to worship Him, to be gathered around Him. But then we move into our next movement. This includes singing and praying. We approach God in our brokenness. If you think about that second section in, in, in movement two of that, that uh, series of events in Isaiah 6, Isaiah finds himself in the presence of God, and he's overwhelmed with his sin. But he cries out. He approaches God, and he cries out, and that's what we do in, in worship. We, we come to God in our brokenness. But then in the third movement of that story, Isaiah 6, verses 6 through 7, we see that God did not leave Isaiah alone in his brokenness. He showed Isaiah inexpressible grace by taking away his guilt and atoning for his sin. 
That imagery in Isaiah's vision is a foreshadowing of how God, through the person and work of Jesus, would redeem his people. We want to rehearse that each week. We want to experience that each week. You and I need that reminder every week of our lives. If not only during this time, we would do our, our, ourselves a big favor by getting in the way of this truth so that we can know that God pursues us in the midst of our brokenness. And then the very last movement in this story that we see in Isaiah 6 is intended to remind us that God loves us. He proclaims his love over us. This includes things like preaching and also communion. These movements are intended to help us rehearse this cosmic gospel story that has been true for the, for the believers of God for as long as there have been believers. But for us to think about the elements and the form of our worship, it's, it's one thing to say, here's what we want to do. Here's what we're trying to pursue. The, another thing is, is to put ourselves in the way of it. And really, as we start this series this, this week, what I want to encourage you to think about is what it looks like to be committed to that kind of pursuit, to put ourselves in the way of, of God's move in our lives in our corporate worship. Here's what that means. It means you've got to be here for that. We can't be formed week in and week out if we have sort of an intermittent interaction with the formation in which God wants to do in our lives. Because the Lord wants to form you theologically, spiritually, in the gospel. And again, you may not in the moment realize what is even going on, but as you put yourself in the way of that week after week, God intends to express to you his love for you and to change you and to form you. In Nicole's song she said i know that time brings change and change takes time and when the sunset comes my prayer would be this one that you might pick me up and notice that i am just a little smoother in your hand that's a really poetic way of saying when our life comes to an end what would it look like for jesus to look at us and say well done good and faithful servant you put yourself in the way of my grace and my gospel. You gave me an opportunity to shape you and to form you. That's what I want for us. That's what I want for myself. I pray that might be true for us in the days ahead. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father.